returning to our uh, short Christmas series, Advent series, on uh, John 3, verse 16, which is that, uh, um, the Lord, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And this morning we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 22. So I'll read verses 1 through 19 of Genesis chapter 22. This is the word of God. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of, that, of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to, to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Thus ends our reading. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible, inspired word, a word of such power, of such sweetness, of such depth, and of such mystery, we confess that we cannot see or understand it, except that your Holy Spirit open our eyes. Father, be with my mouth. Bring together the thoughts of my heart, meditations of my mind in such a way that it is pleasing to you. And give to each one here present, each one listening, all that it is that they need, every, the portion that they, they need to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be lifted up. And Father, again we pray for those, those that do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, have mercy and open their hearts while it is yet daytime. All these things, Father, we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. So last week in preparation for Christmas, we began to study this, this, this text, which is probably the single most famous text in the Bible to all the world, for God so loved the world. And, and it is the, to me, and, and I have yet to hear anyone argue the point with me, but it is the single clearest statement describing the meaning or the significance of Christmas uh, in all the world. In all, the, in, in all the book of our Lord. You will never hear a statement that tells you the meaning of Christmas more concisely, more beautifully than John 3, verse 16. But what does it mean? 
That's the question. What does it mean for God so loved the world? You know, and I, I mentioned that last week too, that this is often used as a, uh, this text is often used by the ungodly. This text is often used by those who really do not have any care for the word of God. They don't have any care or concern for the commandments of God, the truth of God, the love of God. But they'll use this to say, God loves everybody. He, got, he loves everybody wherever you are and whoever you are or whatever state you're in. He just loves you right where you are, the way you are. Is that what this statement is about? Last week, we began to think about this, right? Because we, we, we saw that Jesus is having a discussion with Nicodemus, who is a, a rabbi and a teacher of Israel. But those words would have sounded funny to him, too. For God so loved the world, you know, to... to First century Judaism, that's just dead wrong. There's two types of people in the world. There's God's covenant elect people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which we are. And then there's the rest of the world who are all dying in their sins. They're pagans, they're, they're ungodly, they're nasty. And, and they actually looked at them almost like beasts, which in some sense we are apart from Christ. And what we saw, brothers and sisters, is that both the Gospel of John does not uphold that idea of the world. The world is a dark place. It's filled with darkness. It's filled with sin. It's filled with iniquity. It hates the light. And why? Because the light shines into the darkness. And what we see, too, is that when we went back to Hosea chapter 2, we see that God's own people, his own covenant people, are also indicted. They are charged by God himself. No. You know, you may think that you're the beloved of God, but you've got problems, deep, deep problems. And we saw that uh, in, in uh, Hosea. We see God's people being presented as a faithless woman who gets married and then plays her games. And go, she goes off. She has other lovers. She has uh, a whole other life. But... In the meantime, she receives her food, her care, and everything from her husband. And, and so the indictment is that my people are faithless, adulterous, idolatrous, hypocritical, and finally, very forgetful. But me, she forgot. But me, she forgot, says the Lord. And, and brothers and sisters, the hard reality of Abraham's children in the flesh, as well as the rest of the human race, is that this is who we are. This is according to the, the, the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, when he looks out upon us, this is the whole world. This isn't just the Jews that have, have, have turned their back on his covenant, it's all of us. If anything, we're in a worse state, right? The world is in a worse state than than the children of God who, who have rejected him. But it, it, it's, it's a picture of God's covenant whole um, people, but it speaks to all humanity. But in response to this, response to this picture, what is God's response to this picture? And, and that's where we really begin to like, have to marvel, right? Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in loving kindness, in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. I really love that, that word, I will betroth you, I will betroth you, I will betroth you. Because what it's saying is God's saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to draw you to myself in such a way that our marriage, our relationship, will be like a betrothal. Because the, the thing about betrothal is it's a legal status that in the ancient world, that, that when you declared that you were engaged to a person, you would actually go and you would sign paperwork. And then that period might be last up to a year where the husband or the husband-to-be is getting the house ready, he's getting things prepared so that they can have their wedding and move in together. But the sweet thing about betrothal is what? It's that first love. All the excitement, all the vitality, all the, all the excellence, all the beauty of when you first fall in love is in that betrothal period. And God is saying, I'm going to do something so amazing that our relationship is going to be like that. It's going to be fresh. It's going to be vital. 
It's going to be loving, and it's not going to just be... It's not going to just be for the short period, and then we'll kind of lapse into this married couple. You know, we just kind of accept each other and drive on, and you know, and and you know, we get used to each other. We don't enjoy that that first love anymore. And he says, "No, I'm going to do something amazing. I will allure her, and I will betroth you. I will betroth you. But how will God do this? How will God take a bunch of gomers, so to speak, biblically speaking?" and love us into the kingdom of heaven? How will he take us faithless people, us brokenhearted people, us people who want to love God, but yet when it comes to loving ourselves or loving God, we always tend to fall onto this side. How will God do this? How will he bring faithless, broken humans and love us into the kingdom of heaven? In the book of, in the book of Hosea, It begins with God telling Hosea in chapter 3, verse 1, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself. I bought her for myself. So this begins with God buying his people back. The redemption of God's people begins with the Lord buying back a faithless and an adulterous people who have sold themselves into the bondage of sin. We have sold ourselves, brothers and sisters, into the bondage of our own foolishness, of our own desires, that they own us. And God has to buy us back. So how will God buy us back? That's the question. And that's where we get to the second phrase today of of John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So what does that mean? He gave his one and only son. Well, let's just start. You know, we all think we know and we all do know to a certain extent. Um, But let's just roll it back. Let's look at it like we're looking at it for the first time. Let's look at it like Nicodemus would have looked at it because Jesus said this to him. And, and how would Nicodemus have heard that? When he heard that, uh, that, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, what, would have, what light would have come on in Nic- Nicodemus' mind? And there's only one. To a man that knows the Old Testament scriptures backwards and forwards, because he was a teacher of Israel, so he did, there's one story that clicks in that immediately when you hear that, that he gave his only begotten son, there's only one story that you can pull right back to that all the Israelites knew and to this day still know, which is Genesis chapter 22. Brothers and sisters, Genesis 22 and the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, in fact, to the Jewish people, this is known as the Akedah, which is the, the Hebrew word for um, for binding, the binding of Isaac. And it's such an important text that even to this day in Judaism, and just kind of put this in the back of your mind, it may not say much now, but, but I think it will. They have, a, they have a holiday called Rosh Hashanah, and it is the, uh, the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is, of course, a high holy day in Israel, and for 24 hours before the Day of Atonement that you were to afflict your hearts, God's people were to fast. They were to stop eating for 24 hours straight. They were supposed to come to the Lord in, in affliction. They were supposed to come crying and, and, and thinking upon their sins and iniquities over the past year. And, and the whole idea was is that all this 24 hours, they'd be offering up to God their, their prayers, confessing their sins, confessing their wrongs against each other, etc., and then the next day, the high priest would have this, you know, in front of all of Israel, they would do this Day of Atonement. And even to this day, one of the main readings is this text. But when I went to study and to listen to the rabbis of why they listened to this text for the Day of Atonement, they didn't know. I won't bore you with what they try to say it is, but God has actually put a witness there. And I hope you see why in just a few moments. Um, so this story is an incredibly 
interesting story. It's an incredibly kind of brutal story in some ways. Um, but it's also a very mysterious story, and it always has been. And to the Jewish people, even to this day, they'll, they'll flat out say that, that they don't understand really. They know it's a, a, a critically important story, but they don't know why. So let's see if we can't figure out why. In Genesis 22, what we find is God coming to test Abraham, and, and uh, uh, he has just been given his son. In Genesis chapter 21, we read about the giving of Isaac, that, that after 25 years, because God had come to, to, to Abraham first, he begins his whole plan of redemption for the world with this man, Abraham. He comes to him and says, I want you to leave your father's house, I want you to leave your, the land that you're from, and, and your kinsmen, all your family, leave everything behind and go to a place that I will tell you and I will bless you. I will bless you. I will bless the ones that bless you. I'll curse the ones that curse you. Um, and then he ends up with saying this. He says, and all the earth, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in you. Just a stunning statement, a stunning statement. So Abraham obeys. He and Sarah and Lot, they get up, they gather stuff, they go to Canaan. And for the next 25 years, they're bumping around and, and doing things, and, but no child. How can you have a nation? He says, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a people. How can you have a nation of people if you can't even have that one son? Of course, they, he, he, and, he and Sarah and Hagar mess this up, and he does have another son. His name is Ishmael. But God says, no, he's not the one. There's a son of promise that I will give to you and Sarah. So Isaac comes. And we read in Genesis 22 that, this isn't a couple years later, this is quite a bit later, and you can see that when, when, uh, when Isaac actually, all the wood is loaded on his back. He is not a child. He's not a five or six or seven year old child. He's probably, they think, at least a minimum of 17 years old. And many commentators think he's in his 20s. So that's when this happens. So God comes after having given the promised son, after having fulfilled his promise, and now he says, I want you to give him back. Absolutely brutal, brothers and sisters. The test is horrendous, but we're not gonna spend time on the test. The test, just to tell you what the test is, the test is, will Abraham trust the word of the living God over and above his logic, his morality, and his desires? Because logically and morally, and of course, according to his desires, Abraham has every reason to say, you know what, this is wrong. This cannot be God who's telling me to do this. This cannot be a command of God. This is not a righteous, this is not a legitimate thing. I can put it to the side. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. This test is what it is because this is what we do. When we want to do something different from what God commands, we find reasons in our logic, in our reason. We find reasons in our morality. And we never have to look very hard to find reasons in our desires. But we find reasons to say, no, you know, I, 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 really, I really admire God. I really think a lot of him, and I think a lot of his word, and I agree with most of it, but every now and then, no, this is wrong. This is what we do. This is who we are. That's why the test is what the test is. But I want us to just kind of go along here a minute because I want us to see something else in this text. This is not just about Abraham's faith. This is about the son. Ten times the, name, the word son is used. Three times your one and only son is used. So let's just kind of bump along a moment. And so he hears this command from God, this, this charge from God. And so the next morning... He, he, gets, he, he starts getting ready. He gets his, his donkeys ready. He gets his men ready. He gets his son ready. Um, he chops the wood. He takes fire. He takes, a, he takes a knife. He takes everything they need. And they set off for the place that God tells them. So for the first two days, they're cruising along. They're all together. And on the third day, he sees that place afar off, which God has told him about. And he says to his young man, he says, I want you to stop here. Go aside, wait for me, and me and the lad will go up and, and uh, worship, and then we'll come back to you. Okay, so now, in, starting in verses 6, at the end of verse 6, it says, And the two of them went together. Now notice, if you're looking at your text, and I hope you are, in verse 8, the, the last 
phrase there is, so the two of them went together. Those words are exact. So the two of them went together. Now, look at that as a bracket. Okay, so this is the top of the bracket. This is the bottom. The, 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 the end of, of verse 6 is the, is the top of the bracket. And the end of verse 8 is the bottom of the bracket. So what's in between the bracket? That's what the, that's what the writer, the divine writer, is pointing us to. There's something very important in here. And there's a few things here that I can't just talk about because it's too technical, it takes too long. But um, what we see is he lays the, the, the wood of the burnt offering and on Isaac, his son. He takes the fire in his hand and a knife. And so now the two of them go together. So you can see the two of them in your mind's eye. They're walking together, the older man and the younger man. And the younger man's got all the wood on his back, and the older man has the fire wrapped up probably in something in one hand, and he's got a knife. And then it says, verse 7, But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, Avi, Avi, very powerful word, isn't it? My father, my mother, mom, dad, my father. This is probably the last word that Abraham wants to hear right now. Because his son does not know what's about to come. He knows. He hasn't shared that with anybody. And so he's walking along this whole two days, and all he can think about is what he's going to have to do. And so what do you do when you, want, when you have to do something that you don't want to do? You harden yourself so that you can do it. So I'm going gonna, gonna to kind of distance myself from Isaac. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to distance myself. I'm going to kind of go cold on him. But now he says, my father. That can be an accusation, can it? My father, the one who brought me into this world. My father, the one who provides for me. My father, who keeps me safe and protects me. That's what a father does. My father, who loves me. And God has already attested to the fact that Abraham loves his son. My father. And now we can see Abraham's stuck, isn't he? Because he has a father on high on one hand that has commanded him to do this, and he loves God, and he loves the father. And he trusts the father. But all his life, you know, he's been waiting for this son. And then especially the last 25 years, well, now it's probably closer to about 45 years. This is the son of promise. This is the one out of which the nation shall come. This is the one that out of which the blessings of all the earth shall come. And now my father here is telling me to kill him. And he's my son. So he's stuck. But how does he deal with it? He turns and he faces his son. He says, here I am, my son. Goes right into the middle of it. Somehow, and, and this is where we see, again, the law of God. Somehow, he's found a place, and, and God has given him the strength to love God, but also to love his son. My son. And then, and again, I won't go into the technicals. I, I've done this before with you guys, but there are technical reasons inside the text where Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said. It actually says that Isaac said to Abraham, his father, and he said... And, and the reason that it's put in that way, and it doesn't make sense grammatically, even from a Hebrew standpoint, it does not make sense. But what it is, um, is that the writer is catching Isaac saying something. He starts to say something, and then he stops, as if all of a sudden a thought hits his mind. And then he starts up again. My father, he says... Here I am, my son, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? Isaac has realized something. My dad prepared for everything, but yet there's no sacrifice. And I believe that when he stops there at the beginning of that, he's actually hit, it's starting to hit him. I'm the sacrifice. How does, how does Abraham answer? He says, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. 
But brothers and sisters, the literal reading of that text doesn't read like that. Literally, it reads this way. God will see for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Now, when you put my son in the front, it's clear what you're doing. You're just saying, I'm I'm addressing my son. I'm talking to you. When you put my son at the back, it could be one of two. Right? It's ambiguous. When you put the son at the end, my son, you could be addressing my son, or you could be saying, God will see for himself the lamb, my son. And I believe that at that moment, Isaac knows exactly what's going on. That's why it says, so the two of them went together. Because his, his question has been answered. So here, think about this. Think of this picture. You're looking at these two men, and they're climbing this mountain. It's Abraham and Isaac, and they're going together. They're committed. But now think of another picture. Here's God, and here's Abraham. And they're climbing this mountain together. Abraham is the son that is submitting himself to God. Isaac is the son that is submitting himself to Abraham. There's a There's a very powerful, powerful picture of something very sweet there that he's submitting himself to the Father in heaven and Isaac is submitting himself to his Father on earth. So they too went together. Then they came to that place. God had told them Abraham built the altar there, placed the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar and upon the wood. So if you have a man that's 17 to 20 years old, he can carry all this wood up there, there's no talk here about Isaac fighting him. There's no talk about his dad knocking him out over the head and then laying him down while he's, while he's unconscious. There's none of that. He participates. Even as Abraham is going along trusting the Lord, so Isaac is going along trusting Abraham. And Abraham stretches out his hand and takes the knife to slay his son. So I want you to picture this. He's got the knife up. I always put my left hand because I'm left-handed, but he's probably right-handed. So he's got his knife up. He's looking down. He's looking at his son, whom he loves. He's looking at the place he's going to plunge the knife. And he hears the voice of the angel of the Lord. Call unto him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham. And again he answers. Everybody answers, here I am. Here I am. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. By the way, I think it's very important for us to know that three times... God speaks of Isaac as Abraham's only son. Abraham never says those words, and I don't believe in real life that he probably ever did. He loved Ishmael. It was very evident. He tried to put, he said, oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And and he loved his son, Ishmael, but the Lord said, no. I'm going to, because he's your son, I'm going to bless him. I'm going to take care of him. But he is not the son of promise. These are God's words. You're one and only son. So this is the second time. Now, verse 13. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And again, brothers and sisters, so you've got him up. He's got his hand. He's looking down at his son. Now the angel calls. He looks up. The angel speaks to him. And then it says he lifted his eyes. And, and I don't know why. I, I didn't study. I didn't look this up to find out why. But for some reason, the, the, the New King James does not put the behold in there. It says that, that he looked up and he saw and behold. A ram caught in a thicket behind him. That doesn't make sense. So is the divine writer confused? Does he, is he just kind of lapsed out he's not really picturing what he's writing he doesn't know what he's writing no 
I don't think so at all. I think this is a, it, it, there's something very deep going on in this text, and God is telling us something about this text. So Abraham went and he took the ram, and he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Again, the word instead there is actually a very, very simple Hebrew preposition, and its first meaning is under. So now picture this. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering under his son. So now let's go back to those words. God shall see for himself the lamb for the burnt sacrifice. There's a ram that's actually going to be offered. But what is God seeing? That ram is under Isaac. We don't read of, I, of Isaac coming off the, uh, off, the, off the altar. We don't read of him coming off and him being unbound and then, and then the ram being put on. And to back that up, look at verse 19. In verse 19, so Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Where's Isaac? Isaac was in every part of this all the way up to here. And now Isaac has disappeared. I believe what's happening here, brothers and sisters, is the basis for the whole sacrificial system starts right here. Well, it actually starts in another place, but it like lawfully starts in this place that the whole sacrificial system is built on the idea that God sees his son as the sacrifice. A son that he received from Abraham. Abraham gave his son, and God took him. Isaac belongs to me now. But it's really in Isaac. It's there's someone in Isaac that he sees brothers and sisters, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this for a moment. In Numbers 23, right before the, 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 the Israelites are dealing with Moab and Balak, the king of Moab, and he calls in Balaam, and he's trying to get them, Balaam to curse these people. And here's two verses from the different prophecies that come out of Balaam's mouth. In uh, Numbers 23, verse 21, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob. So think of Balaam. He's up on a hill, and he's looking down at all the children of Israel. And now God puts this vision into his mind, and he's the man who sees his eyes are open, um, but, he, but he sees not the earth. His, his eyes are open, and he's seeing these heavenly visions and it says, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. And what God is saying already back then is that when you're looking at Israel, you know, it's amazing, right? It's a stunning statement because everywhere we read about the, the Israelites, how wicked they are, how they're always complaining, they're always whining, they're always crying. And yet, here's this prophet getting this vision from on high, and he's looking down. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob nor wickedness in Israel. How can that be? Except that God is seeing somebody on top of them. In Numbers 24, verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Who is this star? Who is this king that is among them? Not now, but coming. He is the one without iniquity. He is the one without any wickedness in him. And he is the only begotten son who God gives to us. Abraham, in faith, gave his firstborn son. That's what God calls him, your one and only son. He gave him Isaac. 
And the whole idea is, is that the Christ child that will come out of this people, that will come out of the, out of the body of Isaac and Jacob and Judah and Boaz and David is the one that's speaking in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. A son that's without iniquity, a son without sin, a son who is a king, a son who God sees in our place. He looks at us through him. How can God call a broken, faithless people and say, I'm going to love them into the kingdom of heaven? He gives us, he buys us at the purchase price of his only begotten son. The son whom he sees in our place. And this is what Christmas is about. Amen. Father, once again, I come before you. Uh, we come before you. We come and, and, and we offer this up. Father, we, we know that the Bible is deep. There is so much depth to this. There's so much sweetness, so much power. Things that we cannot fully understand. But yet, you do give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Then in Jesus Christ, we have your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that even as children of God in Christ, that we would only enjoy more and more learning about the depth of your word and how from the very beginning that Christ was before your eyes. For the world was, was created by him, through him, and for him. Jesus Christ knew these texts. He knew your word. And by your Holy Spirit being poured out upon him in unlimited fashion. Even as a human being, his eyes were open to see that Isaac, that what the father was looking at was not Isaac, but it was the star that would come out of Isaac. And he was that star. He is that star. Father, may our hearts be turned to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heal us, strengthen us. May we glorify and exalt you in all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All these things we ask in his name alone. Amen.